along with us. And right now, uh, we're studying through the Gospels. This year, we're in the Gospels and the book of Acts. We happen to be in the Gospel of Matthew. So today, that's where we're gonna be. And a little context of the Gospel of Matthew before we jump in this morning. Um, the Gospel of Matthew is written by a man named Matthew who was a tax collector. He left his, his job of being a tax collector to follow Jesus. Now, Matthew was a Jew. And what we need to understand was that when he wrote this book, the readership was Jewish folks. And the reason why we need to know that is because it reveals the purpose of this gospel, which was to reveal to the Jewish people that Jesus was the Messiah and the King of the Jews. That's the whole goal. So throughout this book, we see that, that Matthew is revealing the person of Jesus the principles of Jesus, but also the power of Jesus. And the one goal is to reveal that he is supreme, that he is the king. And the last few weeks, we've been teaching through a section called the Sermon on the Mount. Anybody grateful for the Sermon on the Mount? Yeah, come on, it's so good. It reveals the principles of Jesus and how to bring the kingdom from heaven to earth, how to live this walk out one day at a time. In the last few weeks, have been incredibly powerful, but we're gonna shift here now into uh, a, a new section where we're gonna see Jesus' power on full display through miracles. And uh, we pick it up actually today in Matthew chapter nine, we're gonna be in verses 18 through 26, but what I want you to know here is that Jesus, he crossed over a, a lake and he arrives uh, uh, on boat, he gets off on land and re recognizes there's a bunch of people there waiting for him. I, I think it's so interesting, the Bible says in another area of scripture that, that Jesus wasn't mad about this, he wasn't bitter about it. As a matter of fact, he had compassion on these people because they were sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus was like, you know what, I'm gonna take these people in. This is what, what I was planning on doing when I came across this lake, but I'm gonna spend some time and I'm gonna begin teaching these folks. So he's teaching them in the midst of teaching these people that are following him. We see this interruption. It's a crucial interruption and we're gonna go straight to the word of God. I want you to see this. Matthew chapter nine, starting in 18, we're gonna read this. It says this, that as Jesus was saying this, as he was teaching about prayer and fasting, the leader of the synagogue came and knelt before him. He cried out, my daughter has just died, he said, but you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hands on her. So Jesus and his disciples got up and went with him. Just then, as they're traveling down the road, a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe. Don't we love this story? For she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that very moment. Come on. Verse 23, when Jesus arrived at the official's home, he saw the noisy crowd and heard the funeral music. Get out, he told them. The girl isn't dead, she's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him. After the crowd was put outside, however, Jesus went in and looked the girl and took the girl by the hand and she stood up. The report of this miracle swept through the entire countryside. Come on, can we just put our hands together for Jesus right now? If you're a note taker today, you can write down today's title. It's help, I'm desperate. The subtitle is who to turn to when you're desperate. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. We're so grateful for the encouragement that Jesus, that you are a God that sits on the throne, that's alive today, that is supreme today, that is still moving throughout the earth. God, we believe that you can still do miracles. Your word says that you're the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. So God, we worship you today. 
some of us find ourselves in seasons of desperation. Nobody around us knows what's going on on the inside of us, but we feel like we're dying. Today, God, would you meet us in this moment of desperation? Would you change everything? I pray for a fresh touch this morning. God, would you receive the glory? In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had a season of desperation? As soon as I asked that question, some of you went back to a serious moment. Others of you went back to a silly moment. Can I tell you about a silly moment of desperation? Can I be vulnerable up here today? Can I be honest in here today? Can I embarrass myself this morning? I'm gonna do that, whether you like it or not. So many of you know that I had the privilege of playing college football at Iowa State. And um, this was from 2006 to 2010. And let me just tell you, in just a short decade, man, things have changed. The amount of money in these programs, the facilities, the different things that they have access to is just on a whole new level. Well, during my time at Iowa State, um, there, was, there were no porta potties or anything on the sidelines. Some teams actually have that today. So we were playing a game in Colorado, and what, what do you do when you're in the middle of a game and you have to use the restroom and go perform at an elite level against guys that wanna absolutely rip your head off? I mean, what do you do? Finish this sen sentence with me. Desperate times call for? <laughs> I don't even need to tell you the rest of the story. You know what I was doing as I was standing there on the sideline. <laughs> if you don't get it, just use your imagination. Yeah, my legs warmed up real quick. <laughs> desperate times call for desperate measures. But what happens when desperate times aren't silly moments, but serious ones? I'm talking about a diagnosis a dumb decision, a disappointing performance, a, race, a relationship that you've destroyed by your own choices, then what? I, I was reminded of just how difficult life can be even this week. I, a couple weeks ago, I was flying back uh, from, a, from a, a business opportunity and as I was landing, I had a text message on my phone that said, call me right away. It was my mother. So I called my mother and she began to share with me how my cousin's wife had passed away from an aneurysm. This week I went back for the visitation. It's a really sad situation. 33 years old. Too soon. They had been married for a year and a half. And uh, it, it was... It was such a tragedy, you know, and the reality is, is sometimes life just shows up on your doorstep and gives you a gut punch. And it's these seasons of disappointment and discouragement that have really one of two opportunities in our life. And this is really what I feel like the, the Lord sent me on assignment to share with us today is that when, when these moments come, they can actually be a great gift. And you're like, gift, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the gift of desperation. See, when difficulty shows up on your doorstep, you have one of two options. You can either get depressed or you can get desperate. Here's what I know. The enemy is trying to get you depressed because it pushes you away from the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is trying to get you desperate because it draws you towards the presence of God. Is anybody with me in here today? So you think about this difficulty that happens in our life, and as we, as we read this text even this morning, we see that difficulty is hitting the lives of two individuals that couldn't be further from one another. I think that's the interesting thing as I think about this idea of desperation and difficulty. It's an equal opportunity offender. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor in the church or out of the church. Difficulty is just going to show up. Is anybody with me today? This is, this is the world that we live in, this fallen world. And 
I know for some of you in here today that it's, it's the very thing that has kept you from God. I want to reveal to you today that it's, it's, it's these seasons, it's these situations where we can actually experience the presence of God, the kindness of God, the breakthrough of God. Do you believe that in here today? That it's in these difficult seasons that we can draw close to our Savior. Now, the two individuals in this particular text are in dire and difficult situations that honestly probably left them a little disappointed. Where do you find yourself today? Before we dive deep into this text, where are you at today? Do you find yourself in a season of difficulty or discouragement? Are you in a season of desperation? Now, I really believe that my goal for you today, if you find yourself in that situation, is that God wants to give you a fresh touch today. I believe that he wants to give you a revelation that he is working in your season and in your situation. Now, if you're in here today and you're thinking to yourself, I'm not very desperate. I'm, I'm just kind of in cruise control right now. Life is groovy. Here's what I feel like the goal is for you today. It's to help you wake up to this reality that when you, when you walk out of these doors today, that you're gonna be surrounded by people who are in seasons of difficulty, discouragement, and desperations. These are people in your neighborhoods, your schools, and your workplaces. And you might just be the answer to their prayer. And if they're not praying people and they don't know God, you might be the one that introduces them to a God that can change their situation. Do you believe it in here today? He has something for each of us in here today. I really believe that difficulty and discouragement can be a gift. Desperation that causes us to cry out to a God that sees us and hears us and can move in miraculous ways. I wanna go back into the text and we're just gonna walk through this text a little bit deeper. Go back to verse 18. As Jesus was saying this, the leader of the synagogue came and knelt before him. Now, we don't read the leader's name in this account, but in Mark's account of this story, we learn that this, name, this man's name is Jairus. Now, what's interesting about this situation is he was kneeling before Jesus. Now, I want you to understand why this is such an important piece for us to understand. Because what you need to know is as the leader of the synagogue, this was gonna be a man of great influence and power this was gonna be a man with great riches and a man of this stature in that day would never kneel or plead or show emotion before another man. It was considered shameful. However, when your little girl is dying, you don't care what men normally do. You see things differently. In Luke's account, we learn that this was his only daughter this little girl must have meant the world to this man. Come on, some of you in here today, you, you know what it feels like to be so desperate that you don't care what the person to your right or to your left thinks. Now, there's something powerful when we come into even the presence of God in this place and our hands aren't in our pockets. We're not concerned about what's going on around us, but we're concerned about the one that we're lifting up. We know that, man, we're gonna do whatever it takes to come to him. And in this moment of desperation, this man comes and kneels before God. He says, my daughter has just died, but you can bring her to life again if you just come and lay your hands on her. Here's the beautiful thing. As we read the Gospels, and somebody needs to hear this in here today, every single time somebody cries out to Jesus, he responds. See, my faith is built in the response here in verse 19. It says this, so Jesus and his disciples got up and went with him. Some of us in here have been duped to believe a lie that when you, you cry out to a God that doesn't listen or hear you. Look at Jesus responding to this religious man. This was probably a man that was talking noise about Jesus behind his back. And here Jesus is responding to his request saying, this is going to be my moment. 
Why do you think Jesus even challenged us? He says, yo, you guys are just loving people that love you. Anybody can do that. But I'm calling you to something different. Didn't we just learn that in the Sermon on the Mount? Here's a beautiful picture where Jesus is actually saying, this is going to be my opportunity with this religious man. So they go on this journey and then this woman shows up. Verse 20, just then a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. Now I want you, I want this to sink in for a second. We're talking 12 years Some of us can't even take waiting 12 minutes in the line at Chick-fil-A. Hello, somebody. Come on, we live in a microwave culture, don't we? Just get observant this week. You just got to drive down the road and look to your right and your left, and you'll see the, the impatience of humanity. It's crazy. We're so impatient, but for 12 years, this woman has suffered with constant bleeding. Now, this would be a polite way of saying that she had uncontrollable menstrual flow. And this particular disease or sickness that she was facing wasn't just leaving her sick, but likely she was in a lot of pain and unlikely to ever have children. And this was a shameful thing in this day. Now, in Leviticus chapter 15, we learn that women who struggled in this manner were deemed ceremonially unclean, which meant two things. One, that no one could touch her or they would become unclean. She also wasn't allowed to worship God in the synagogues. As a matter of fact, typically you would never see a woman struggling like this in a big crowd. 12 years, y'all, 12 years she's struggling. She probably hasn't received a hug in 12 years. Can you imagine that? No wonder she, she felt so hopeless and helpless. She was probably extremely lonely. Now, in Mark's account, it's interesting because what we learn from this situation is that In Mark's account, it says that she suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. What's interesting is what we learn about this is is not only did she suffer under their care, but the scripture actually says she got worse. So this situation has caused her to lose her identity her relationships, and even her finances. In the account in Mark, it says that she went broke trying to reach out to all these doctors. Now, some of you have been so desperate in here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've tried every option there is. Now, it's so interesting because when I read this text, it makes me think about this reality, is that in that crowd, because the issue that she was struggling with was an issue on the inside, you probably could never point it out on the outside. In other words, that woman could be in a crowd just like this, and there's no way that we could point out that she was unclean or that she had an issue unless she told us. Now, I find that interesting, and I want to pause here for a second, because although that that issue was going on on the inside, It affected her whole world on the outside. There are some of us in here today that you've got a hidden issue. You've got a hidden struggle. It's an addiction. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it is depression. I, I don't know what your issue looks like today. But don't dismiss this text because you're like, oh, an issue of blood or sickness. I don't really relate to that. But there are some of us that come in and out of these doors every single week. And freedom is in the house of God, but we leave in bondage because we don't want to release that thing. We don't want to expose that thing. We want to actually believe the lie that it's not impacting the people around us. In the same way that this issue was making people unclean if she touched them. I want you to know that whatever that sin struggle is, whatever that thing is that has you in bondage, it is impacting the people around you. 
Today is the day to get free. This, this woman was so desperate. 12 years, she's tried doctors. She's given her finances. And you know what? She finds herself in a desperate moment thinking, maybe Jesus can heal me. Can you imagine what she may have felt? And I think that this, this scene that we see here between these two individuals creates a, a complete contrast. Jairus is a name everybody knows. She has a name that nobody knows. He's wealthy, she's poor. He's got a daughter who is 12 years old and sick. She's been sick for 12 years. He is the leader of a synagogue. She's not allowed in a synagogue. He was respected and she was rejected. Here's what I know. It just reminds me that Jesus came to save the whole world. It doesn't matter who you are. This isn't a gospel just for the broken people. As a matter of fact, there are some of you that live in million dollar houses that drive hundred thousand dollar cars that are leading companies. And right now you need to get desperate for Jesus. You need to get desperate for Jesus because those things are not buying your ticket to heaven. They're not making you right with God. There's nothing wrong with those things, but it doesn't matter if you're this, this woman who's isolated and rejected and poor, or you're this man, Jairus, who's rich and has influence and everybody knows him. We all have the same need and our need is for Jesus. Are you with me today? So what happens in this text? She touched the fringe of his robe. Verse 21, for she thought, for she thought, I want you to circle that. If I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. <laughs> How did she know this? How did this thought provoke her to action? Think about that for a second. It, I say this, thoughts become things. You think it before you walk it. Now, what provoked the thought, though? It's interesting because in, in the account in Mark, it says this, when she heard about Jesus, she moved. Oh, that's so good. So she had a thought in Matthew that caused her to cry out to Jesus. Oh, if I just touch his robe, he will heal me. But what we learn about in, in Mark's account is that she first heard before she had the thought. So the question is, what did she hear? Are you asking that? I'm asking that. Like, what did she hear? Are you wondering that? I did. Maybe she heard testimonies of the miraculous healings of Jesus. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So here she is amongst this crowd. Jesus is doing these miracles. And here's what I know. There are some of you that came in here today and you're asking the question, could God do it for me? And then Ashlyn stands up here nice and bold and shares her testimony. And in that moment, as her testimony is going forth, faith is rising in your heart. It's the power of testimony. So maybe, and perhaps that's what's going on here. Or maybe she heard the prophecy that was given in Malachi 4.2. Write this down. That when the Messiah came, he would rise, quote, with healing in his wings. Oh, this is so good. The Hebrews in this day, they were commanded by God to wear special tassels at the corner of their garments. And these tassels were called the zit zit and were a reminder to obey God's commandments day and night. Have you ever seen Orthodox Jews walking around with those things hanging off their, their clothes? Have you ever wondered what those are? Well, that's what they are. They wear them as a reminder to obey God's commandments. It was almost like a declaration. Now, what's interesting, the word wings in Malachi 4.2 in Hebrew is kanath, which is translated to corner. So the Hebrew people were waiting for the Messiah to come with healing in his kanath or corner or wings. Maybe it was this prophetic promise that proved to the woman that she could step out and reach for his garments. This is beautiful. Whatever it was, here's what we do know, is that in her desperation, she was willing to take a shot. Will you take a shot today? I wanna declare over somebody's situation today, it's been six years you've been trying to get pregnant. God's delay is not God's denial. 
Will you keep on knocking? Will you keep on trusting? Will you keep on believing? If I'm still breathing, breakthrough can still be on the horizon. Come on, is faith in the room today? Do you believe it? I believe today that the war is for faith or unbelief. What is it? I think about the, the, the picture in Mark chapter nine, that this boy is just being tormented by a demon. And the father's like, Jesus, will you do something? And, but he says this, if you can, would you do something? And he's like, if you can, do you believe? And he says, I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. Listen, it's okay to, to be real in the house of God. I get it. And we're gonna see it here in a second. It's not about the size of your faith. It's about the source of your faith. It's about mustard seed faith in the house of God. Come on, somebody. Can you just lean into that thought for a second today? So we see here that as this woman is reaching out, she's risking everything. She's risking scorn and shame. She, she's fighting through crowds. It's almost like this is her last ditch effort. She had to have touched a bunch of people on her way. And by the way, she's reaching out, ceremonially unclean, reaching for a holy rabbi. Do you understand what kind of faith this woman was exercising? She wasn't worried about what any else was thinking. And I think for some of us today, we would be better off if we stopped caring so much about what everyone else thought. We declare in the house of God that fear of man would be broken off. For so many years, I thought that my faith needed to be private. Man, that is a bunch of private. What about the Great Commission? It's not a private faith. We got to get bold and courageous, church. Jesus didn't save us, heal us, and deliver us so that we could be separated. No, he, he saved us, healed us, and delivered us so we could be salt, so we could preserve the earth, bring heaven to earth, go make a difference in spaces and places. It's not time to blend in any longer. It's time to stand out to walk in the authority and the power that he's graced each of us. He said, I've done some great works, but I'm gonna go be with the Father because you're gonna do greater works. Greater works, greater works, greater works. That's why I get encouraged by you, Scotty. I'm gonna talk to Scotty for a second. Because in the church, we over-spiritualize this position right here. The reality is, how many people are you leading in your business? One at a time, that's a good answer. <laughs> the spirit of the living God is in this man. And he's walking into his business each and every day. And his prayer ought to be God. You've sent me on mission into this place. I want to be used of you. And it's interesting because I've heard stories and testimonies of people bumping into him at just the right time and their life is never the same. That's just one person. Imagine a church full of people that are walking in this kind of conviction and authority. It's powerful. Now let's get back to the text. We see this in 22. Jesus, what's he do? She reaches for the garment and the Bible says that he just keeps on walking. He knows everything. He, he just like everybody, rejects this woman. Doesn't even look at her. No, that's false because that's not who our God is. Faith always gets the attention of your creator. In both instances, Jairus and the woman, completely different situations, decide to exercise their faith in desperation, and Jesus responds both times. 
One, by getting up and going to Jairus' house. And number two, by turning around and looking at the woman. Now, when I read the Bible, it's funny because you're kind of getting pulled into two different stories here. And I think it's so interesting because I started thinking, what was going through Jairus' mind in this moment? As a matter of fact, have you ever been in a situation where you're waiting in line and somebody cuts in line to get ahead of you and you're like, come on, man. That's probably how Jairus is feeling right now. Like, girl, you've been struggling for 12 years. Can't you wait another hour? My daughter's about to die. If Jesus were a doctor, this would be called malpractice. But Jesus always responds to faith. It's so beautiful. He interrupts, she interrupts this moment where they're going to, 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 to pray for Jairus. Now, I think this is interesting and And I want to make this point because I I was thinking about this this week. This woman had no business being in this crowd. Yet she was. So she's following the crowd that is going to pray for this little girl. This is a word for somebody in here today. I want you to go look at Job 42.10. There's a shift that happens in Job's life and there's a principle here that I think we we need to see. When Job prays for his friends, now if you don't know the story of Job, Job loses everything. And he goes through this season where he's kind of going through some self-pity and who wouldn't? He lost everything. But in a moment it says that when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. So when he got his eyes and his mind and his focus off his own situation and he got it on somebody else's, the breakthrough came. Oh, come on, somebody. This woman started moving in a new direction. For 12 years, she was consumed with herself. And then she got about Jesus' business and said, you know what? I'm going to follow you. But in the midst of that, she got really desperate. I would imagine... That when when Jesus responded to Jairus, that that was the last sort of thing that needed to break for her to be like, you know what, I'm actually gonna test this. I'm gonna see if he'll do it for me. What's so interesting about this passage of scripture is she was hoping to not get any attention. She was so used to being in private, she didn't want to make a public spectacle. But it was important to Jesus to address her publicly. So you can only imagine what what must have gone through her mind as Jesus turned and locked eyes with her. And I don't know how long he stared at her before he said what he said, but I would imagine that she was having thoughts like, will he reject me too? Will he shame me too? He knows I'm not supposed to be touching anyone. So here's this woman, unclean and defiled, touching a holy rabbi. In most cases, when this happened, the clean person became defiled by the unclean. It'd be like for those of you that are sick with the flu and you you give your spouse the sickness, now both of you are sick. What's wild about this instance is when the unclean woman touched clean Jesus, she became clean and healthy. So what happened to the uncleanness? This is the beauty of the gospel, my friends. Yes, there's a miracle of healing that's happened, but this is a great illustration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus takes it for us on the cross. He who knew no sin, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is the core of the gospel. It's called substitution. He took our sin, our shame, and our sickness on the cross so that his healing and his fellowship with the Father could be passed on to us. Is anybody thankful for this picture this morning? That in this moment, she receives wholeness and purity. She wasn't just healed though. 
because what he says to her might be one of the most important teaching moments in the life of Jesus. You have to understand now, friends, this is Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. He is holy and blameless. And he's just been touched by a woman who is ceremonially unclean. And look at what he says to her. Daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. Scholars submit the word daughter that Jesus uses here is a term of intimate endearment. This was a term that would never be used with someone you just met. The nameless girl, nobody wanted near them, has just been called precious daughter by the ultimate father. What a beautiful moment this is. Can we just celebrate right now? I want somebody to hear this today. Jesus becomes to us what we lack. To the sick, he's healer. To the fatherless, he becomes father. To the lonely, he becomes friend. To the poor, to the poor he becomes their riches. No, I love it because Jesus isn't done. He, he finally arrives at the official's home. There's a noisy crowd there that is already mourning the loss of this woman. It says that funeral music is being played and Jesus comes, comes in and says, get out. The girl isn't dead. She's only asleep, but the crowd laughed at him. They thought that he was being insincere. Jesus goes in, and I think that this is such a beautiful picture of how our Savior has conquered death. It just says that he took the girl by the hand and she stood up. The report of this miracle swept through the entire countryside. Jesus walked in calmly, facing the most feared enemy of the human race, death, and treats it like he is just waking up a little girl from her nap. This ought to deposit great faith in our souls today. Let's stand to our feet today. Here's the beauty of today's message. I had three takeaways and three points for us that I didn't even get to because God just wanted us to lean in to the word of God today. But I want you to write these these things down and I want you to ponder on these things this week as you continue to sit in what the Holy Spirit wanted to speak today. But the first thing that I wanted to share from this story is this, that desperation is the gift that causes you to follow the right crowd. Jairus, a religious man that probably didn't want to get around Jesus until his daughter was dying. A woman in isolation probably didn't want to be shamed, but they both found themselves amongst a crowd that was following Jesus. What crowd are you running with today and what path are they taking you down? Are they moving you towards Jesus or away from him? Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Some of you in the room today, you're stuck because you are settling in your friendships. You are stuck in foolishness because you're hanging around fools. It might be time for a new crowd. You might need to group your life. What do I mean? It's time to join a group so you can be in community with the people pursuing Jesus. Is anybody thankful for their community? Is anybody thankful for the community of God? This church isn't special because of the music that's played. This church isn't special because of the preaching on this platform. This church is special because of the community of God, the relationships in this house. Come on, if you can testify to that today, would you just make some noise to Jesus today? The second thing is this, desperation is the gift that brings you to the feet of Jesus. Both Jairus And the woman ended up at the feet of Jesus in desperation. One due to their daughter's sickness and the other because of their own. You see, here's what I want us to know, and this is where we're going to finish today, that we are like the woman and the little girl, whether we want to admit it or not. Our sin has left us diseased and unclean. 
guilty and separated from a holy God. We are helpless and hopeless apart from an encounter with the living God. Money can't buy you a ticket to heaven. Good works won't punch your ticket. Going to church won't be enough. Education and scientific progress can't fix our issue. Not only do these things not fix our problems or our issue, but it's just like the woman. They actually make them worse. We try to use these things to pacify our pain, to cover our own guilt, but it only makes our hearts harder. And in our ridiculous attempts, in our own strength, it only leads to greater pride and selfishness. Now, I believe that there comes a point in our life where a sense of urgency comes on the inside of us. This man and this woman had a sense of urgency because they were in desperate situations. Here's what I wanna tell somebody today, that when you find yourself at the feet of Jesus, you are always in position to receive the miracle. And I believe that today, at Love Church, where we talk about our desire being for you to experience God's best, when we talk about living the 5S life, being surrendered, surrounded, spirit-led, self-fed, and sent, let me just tell you, friends, the other four don't matter if we don't come to a place of surrender at the feet of Jesus. It's not a one-time surrender, it's a daily surrender. It's saying, God, kill me, fill me, and send me. It's saying, God, I need more of you. It's coming to the feet of Jesus. It's dining with him in his word. It's crying out to him in prayer. It's following his ways because his ways are the best ways. We've got to come to this moment of surrender. And I believe in a place like this today, there are some of us that we just need to have a moment where we come to the feet of Jesus. That just like the woman and just like Jairus, Today, we can't look to our right or to our left. As a matter of fact, we need to fight through the crowd in this place today to come to the feet of Jesus. Because when we come to the feet of Jesus, we are in position to receive a miracle. I believe that the spirit of the living God is gonna give you a fresh touch today. And whether you're in need of a miracle or you are in need of salvation, today is the day that it's gonna happen in the house of God but you gotta respond by faith.